Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and my guest today is Tina and Dave Payne. Not only are they good friends of mine, but they are also exceptionally well-traveled. Uh, they have also brought in some really interesting products into the North American market, including Front Runner and most recently the C6 Outdoors Rev Tent. But what we talk about in today's podcast is really about their travels throughout the Americas as a family. They travel with themselves and their two sons in a Land Rover Discovery. So please enjoy my varied conversation with Tina and Dave Payne. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. All right, hello and welcome to all of you to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with my good friends, Tina and Dave Payne. And we have spent a lot of time together in various parts of the world, including Africa. That's right. We've, I forgot we've, about that. We've traveled together as well. And you guys have an absolutely fascinating story. And I think so many lessons that can be shared with our audience. So I'm so grateful that you two are on the podcast with me today. So well, uh, thanks for having us. Thanks, Scott. Uh, absolutely. And, and I would love to start it with you, Tina, because... You grew up in South Africa. This yes. is a place that so many overlanders aspire to visit. And in many ways, it was the birthplace of overlanding along with Australia. And there's so many lessons to be learned with how Africans travel, overland, uh, and the experiences that you've had. So talk a little bit about what it was like to grow up in South Africa and to grow up with an adventurer as a dad. Yes, so. yes. So my dad was a big, is a big adventurer and loves the African bush. And so a lot of our vacations as kids were bush vacations. And rooftop tents and things like that were just something that was the norm. Yeah. And, and, and why, why did... South Africans use roof tents. This is the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand. Why, th- why do you even use them to begin with? I think just the remoteness of the places you were camping. Uh-huh. They, it, it wasn't this... In America, I feel like you have a lot of national parks and you're never, I don't know, more than 13 clicks away from gas yeah, sure. and everything else. And with a rooftop tent, I feel feel like you had your entire you basically had your daily driver become your rv yep. and so you could sleep there and you could set up camp in very remote areas and do primitive camping which is a lot of what that was because sure. there are still places in africa where you can go where there's no one that's right how much you know? how i think what scott's asking is how much does it have to do with lions <laughs> you know I don't know how much it has to do with lions, to be completely fair. I think, you know, if I look at how my dad used to go camping, he used to do a thing with 10 friends, would go for 10 days to the middle of nowhere in the Cocoa Felt or somewhere. And I think they just slept in sleeping bags on the ground. I mean, there's stories of elephant tracks in between the sleeping bags yes. the next morning. So I don't know. I mean, I do remember also sleeping in a rooftop tent with my sister on one of these trips and waking up to like crunching and elephants were eating in the trees that our tent was in. (laughs) So I don't know that being up high was that different. You're you're at elephant mouth height. I'm at (laughs) elephant mouth height. So luckily they don't eat people. I think you're right. And I think that that's part of the misconception is that South Africans use roof tents because of lions. I think that it's probably more relevant 
for like a black mamba, for example, like those, the snakes in Africa are extremely deadly. That's um, true. But and can't they climb up trees? They, <laughs> they can, they can. Yeah. I mean, I think also it was about the compactness of, it was a way to travel where you had, where you would sleep, you had everything you yeah. needed in one I th- vehicle. I think having traveled to South Africa a lot um, due to my lovely wife, that I think South Africans know it's nice, yeah. right? Like with food yeah. and with how to entertain with their brides. And I think they're like, if I'm going to go out and sleep someplace, I want to sleep comfortably. Yeah. I think the tent was a way to move a mattress around the rooftop yeah. tent. And for, right? for us, I mean, I remember with America and rooftop tent camping not even being a thing. I mean, when we first had, I think... Frontrunner was one of the first two companies to sell rooftop tents in America. Yeah. And um, when we would go camping on the beach, I mean, people would come up to us and climb into the roof. They'd never seen anything yeah. like it before. But the downsides for me was if we went to a national park or we went camping, your campsite was not where your vehicle was. Yeah, sure. So you'd set up your campsite, but your fire and everything else was so <laughs> far away so unless you're dispersed camping the, then you can make your nice little compound yeah and the beauty of the rooftop tent was the mattress yeah, it was sure. like okay you're going to sleep comfy <clears throat> you don't have to sleep on an air mattress you're going to d- be comfortable dark when and, the, in the morning they, they don't a little and they're a little it. warmer yeah, if you're sure. off the ground yeah those kinds of things but ultimately i think that's also how the rev tent was born dave and i were like well what if you wanted to go camp by that waterfall right there but now you're tent is stuck on your truck and your truck can't go there or what if you set up camp and now you want to go three miles down the road to go fishing but now you've got to put everything back together just to go down the road so i think um rooftop tent camping in south africa was a convenient thing and also because you were so far from anything else and now rooftop tent camping for me is all about the mattress I'm all about the mattress. It's the reason to sleep up high is the mattress. I think that you make a good point, Dave. I think that when when I go traveling with South Africans, they camp so much and it's such a part of their culture. Like I think about, you know, Jess from Easy On or like your your dad, Stanley. Yeah. Um, these guys have camped for decades and they kind of got it sorted out. They want right. to wait. They want to wait to make a great barbecue or braai like you call it. Yep. And they want to have a... a comfortable place to sleep yep. and and also like you know you just never know what your campsite's going to be sometimes and then you always know that your your tent's going to set up on your roof and um, so i think that there's some flexibility with that too but it is interesting that there are so many south africans that don't camp in roof tents they camp in ground tents as well yes and they've got these really beautiful, you know, canvas or thicker walled or but really they travel with a cot they do or, yeah. Uh, yeah 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 yeah, no, I think I think also there's just uh, it's it's not a big deal yeah. to go camping. Yeah, like I think we grew up with it not being other. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't called overlanding. Yeah, what sure. we were doing, and yeah. we were overlanding. Like Dave and I went on honeymoon, and we went all through Botswana and Namibia, and we had a truck with a rooftop tent. Yes. and it, at that time, I mean, we're talking about nearly. 15, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. So it wasn't, it didn't have a name. Yeah. It was just how we were traveling. And sometimes camping. Yeah, we went camping, we yeah. went camping and, and sometimes we'd stay in lodges. Yeah. That was the other thing. I think also we're not, I don't think South Africans feel like you have to camp. Yeah. You know, if there's a beautiful lodge, you'll stay in the beautiful lodge and then you'll camp out of necessity. If you, you know, making your drive and you've hit a place where, okay, there's no, there's no town nearby yeah. and you're tired and you don't want to keep driving. And so you have the capacity with your setup to be able to pull over and go a few hundred meters into the bush and set up your camp. And even, even in some sort of national parks, I think, you know, we do that. And yeah, if someone came by, you'd be like, yeah, it got late, it got dark. We set up here, yeah. and there was like an understanding. Sure. sure, okay, yeah, you're not meant to camp here, but okay. I mean, there's the bit of the wild west there where sure. it's not as regulated, so that's possible. But yeah, it was just more of a way to vacation than a big expedition type yeah. serious thing. Yeah, 
It was just a part of life yeah. in South Africa. The way you, yeah, the way you went on holiday. Are there some Are there some funny stories that come to mind of when you were growing up and camping? Like just the crazy. What What are some of the craziest things that happened to you and your family when you were out, just trying to go camping for the weekend? You know, my dad always had this thing where he was like, "You have to be organized." If you're not organized, you're not going to have a nice time. And his organized meant, you know, you, if you're not organized, you're going to be cold or you're going to be hungry. Sure. And so he had very specific rules, like you were never to bring eggs. You were never bringing eggs. That was just a stupid thing to do. <laughs> like you were never going to bring eggs or tomatoes. To this day, we are not allowed to bring eggs no, camping. No. no, we don't bring eggs or tomatoes because they just smush. Um, yeah. So... Um, yeah, I think we, my dad had had some really interesting things. I, I think I remember when they were doing one of their trips, um, they had a friend who fell asleep where he, <laughs> um, he woke up and he was like, well, the ground's moving. It's moving. It's slowly, but it's moving. And he turned and his sleeping bag string had hooked onto the back leg of a hippo uh -huh. who was grazing. And he was just, the hippo was just completely unaware that he was dragging France while he was grazing. <laughs> and he was like, okay, how do I get out of this? Yeah. And he kind of was slipping, slipping the string yeah. off of the back leg when it was lifted up. Um, so crazy things like that. But I think also when we went... Is that went, Franz Chepik? That was actually another Franz, Franz oh, okay. Bendik, okay. who also, he was a German guy. He's uh, since passed away. But he was amazing. He would not travel with anything other than Perrier. <laughs> so he needed his Perrier water. And this was back in the time when it came in glass bottles. And yeah. it would drive my dad crazy because he's like, who takes glass yeah. on a camping trip? You don't even this take is, an egg. Who you don't glass? take an egg. Who takes glass? <laughs> so he had his, and this is a brilliant story. So they were up in the middle of nowhere. I think it was northern Namibia, somewhere like that. And they had camped by a river and France was so excited because now he could take this bottle of Perrier and he could put it in the river and it could cool overnight it was going to be spectacular <laughs> the next morning and he did that and they woke up in the morning and some koi bushmen had come down and there were women who were just you know washing things in the mm -hmm. river and she saw this bottle and she opens the bottle of Perrier and she sniffs it and she's like Oh, my God. She pours the whole <laughs> bottle out and fills it with river water and starts drinking. She was like, there's something very wrong with that water. That water uh, is not good water. That's such, that's such a great story because it is so much about perspective. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So for her, it was like, why? But now that is very much an overland thing. Bubbly water. It is now a thing. Bubbly water. Really? Yeah. It, it appears to be. The Bendik case. would appreciate. He would <laughs> <Yeah>. appreciate. <laughs> Look at what he started. The trend, yeah, that, exactly. the trend that he started. Do the earth roamers have soda streams built in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's an option. I'm sure that's an option. Talk a little bit about how you went from living in Johannesburg, traveling around South Africa, and now you're sitting here in Prescott, wow. mar married to an American. Like, what was the, what was that? How did you get from South Africa to America? So I was very excited to leave home, not because I didn't have an absolutely charmed childhood. I was just one of those independent people who was just dying to, you know, do things on my own. Sure. And I left um, South Africa when I was 19. I went to a drama school in London where my dad thought I'd meet a lot of strange people and then eventually <laughs> go home and do something sensible. <laughs> and, then, um, and then I landed up in L.A. Um, basically for work. I, I'd finished my, um, my drama school in London and I, there was a director to meet here and I was meant to come for two weeks. And then I applied for my green card and it was literally back in the pre 9-11 days sure. so I got I applied for a work permit and a green card and I got the green card before I got the work permit so I ended up moving here and um, my training was all in classical theater so I was very interested in film and tv and and learning about that so I was interning and 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 stuff while I was in LA and then Dave and I met at a party 
and I took him a bit, and then I lost, and I had to marry him. And, like <laughs> the rest is history. We, we met before smartphones, and she, <laughs> she she insisted that she was correct about something. We couldn't instantly check, so it was a good yeah, excuse you to Google it. It was a good excuse to exchange numbers because we had to go back home. Yeah, and then tu- tunnel through AOL to the World Wide Web <laughs> to then get the answer. Well, actually, I think I had a play ball. That we had the answer and it was at home. And so I looked at the play ball and I lost the bet. And I was like, dang, I've got to pay him and I don't have the money. <laughs> and I phoned him and I was like, oh God, he's going to think, he's going to think I'm going to want to date him. And I don't know how to I date. I was happy for her to work it off. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know how to date. Like this dating thing, I'm a serial monogamist. Like if I kiss you, I'm with you for six months. <laughs> like this isn't going to happen. So I called him and I was like, okay, I owe you the money. I don't have the money. I can pay you in installments. And Dave was like, well, we can start with a dinner. <laughs> and I was like, okay, but it's not a, it's not a date. It's a settling of a bet. And he was like, absolutely. I do not date actresses. <laughs> so... <laughs> So that's how that uh, all happened. Uh, so I groomed Tina into becoming a producer. <laughs> and then he married me. And then I married him. <laughs> he wouldn't marry an actress. <laughs> so so the acting thing is so fascinating too. So talk a little bit about some of the acting that you did. So um, in the beginning, um, it was a lot of voiceover. I guess I was yeah, lucky great voice, yeah. in my accent and there was a big thing in a lot of the PlayStation games where they were looking for what they called like mid-Atlantic or transatlantic kind of accent. And so I did a lot of like PlayStation voices for games sure. back in the day. And then um, Dave and I ended up um, actually making a movie together that I acted in and Dave wrote and directed and did, composed the music. It was a horror film. And we had great success with that. And What's the name of the film? It's called Reeker. Reaper. It's about a smelly monster. Okay. So um, we did that. And uh, yeah, I think during the process, I kind of realized that the acting part of it wasn't what I loved about acting. I think if you'd asked me at drama school like, or told me that, you know, you would, you know, eventually not want to be an actor. Um I think as an actor, you're coming from inside a story mm. and you're, you know, you're, it's very sort of insular and you're the character within the story. And when we made Rika and I got to produce, I was really excited by the fact that you could be involved in the whole story and you could put the whole thing together. Yeah. I also did have an acting agent in South Africa who always said to me, you're too bossy to be an actress. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, you are my agent, so it's not so good that you don't feel like I should be an actor because you're my acting agent. But um, I think she was right. I, I, I didn't like other actors. Yeah, I sure. felt like people were so self-absorbed. And I really found a means to be involved in. I think it also depends on why you're an actor. I think yeah. I, I, my initial wanting to go into acting was my love of storytelling. Sure. I love stories and um, storytelling. And I think that the producing gave me a much better or sort of coming at the story from a lot of different angles rather than from just inside that story well and you're really good with details and you're good with coordinating people and finding yeah and i love the people talent. stuff yeah, exactly sure. i love the people yeah, stuff. it seems like a natural transition yeah well so dave yes where did you grow up i grew up in chicago oh okay and uh made my way to iowa for college okay and then made my way to california because that's where movies are made <laughs> <laughs> or were made in yeah. the day <laughs> yeah and and yeah. talk talk about about your time making movies I mean it's just like for me uh, I've never watched one of your films because a Harry Potter is an 11 for me <laughs> right. so like I just like I cannot watch scary movies I'll never sleep again is well, the problem and, and horror movies are like marzipan you're either in or you're out there's <laughs> yeah. no in between like you either love marzipan or you don't yeah. there's no like oh yeah I can do a little bit of marzipan <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. yeah I rolled into LA uh, on a around midnight on December 31st. And in the neighborhood I, I was moving to, there was a f- film being made you know, on, on, on a holiday, you know, at, late at night. And uh, it turned out it was Roger Corman's studio. And Roger Corman um, is known as sort of the king of the B-movies. He's produced 
probably over 500 movies. Um, and talking to some friends about what I was going to do for work, you know, some people in the neighborhood, they're like, you should walk over to the studio around the corner. They're always looking for people. So I walked in and they, you know, basically I gave them my, my student films and won some awards. And I'm like, I'm looking for directing work. You know, I, I don't know how it works. Yeah. And they're like, we don't have a directing job for you, but we are looking for interns, you know, to PA and I'll, <laughs> yes. I'll take it, you know? So yeah. I worked for free for a while and I worked my way up through that company from uh, working for free to doing craft service. When I did craft service, I would um, ser- put the put the breakfast out, put some snacks out, then I'd take a two hour break and watch one of Roger's movies, and then I would put the lunch out, go shopping, take a break, watch another of Roger's movies. Because what I was trying to do is figure out the formula for what he what kind yeah, of movies he sure. wanted to make. Sure. So after doing that for three or four months, I um, wrote a script that I sold to him, um, and then eventually I went basically from craft service to directing movies for this guy, and I made. 12 features for this company, all different genres. None of them were horror. There was a sci-fi thriller. There were a couple comedies. There was a a tough cop noir thing. And there was a stripper movie. Um, What was your favorite? of uh, Probably this cop noir thing called, it ended up being called Urban Justice. Um, nice. But yeah, but, but it was a fun place. It was basically like grad school for yeah, filmmaking because yeah, you got sure. to you got to play with a bunch of different genres. So I, they made maybe 14 movies a year. And towards the end, it kind of got maybe my pick of what I wanted to do. So I always made sure I was doing a genre that I hadn't done before. Sure. Um, but there was fun stuff. Like I put Will Ferrell in his first movie wow. and um, Jason Sudeikis in his first two movies. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people that kind of went through that, that yeah. uh, factory. Um, and then after that, I made some independent films, worked for some other people, and I met Tina, and we, um, we decided to basically start our own business, which was making our own independent film. So it was more or less raising the money, hiring the, the, the team, you know, uh, you know, getting your employees, uh, creating a product. In this case, it's just one product, yeah. one movie mm-hmm. that all the money and time goes into. And it takes about a year, year and a half to get the whole thing done, then you have this one product you have to sell. It's like do or die yeah. with the one product. You're all yeah. in. All in, the whole investment, all the investors, all the people, this one. And there's only like seven people to sell to, so it's not even, yeah, sure. <laughs> the odds are so crazy. <laughs> but we lucked out. We we got in a bunch of big festivals. We were in um, um, South by Southwest and um, Tribeca. we did Tribeca. Anyway, we sold the movie. We made money. So we made a couple more independently. Um, and you know, made money. It was good, uh, but it was still super, super risky. Every time we did it, we were like walking on eggshells. Like sure. this, we are not big gamblers that way. Right. And I think neither of us love the art of it enough to risk everything on it. Like yeah. to risk the house and the livelihood. And you know, we wanted to have a family. And we wanted to we're like, well, how artsy are we that we want to continue <laughs> yeah. taking these risks? And at that point, I didn't really want to work for anybody else. We had the we had the independent bug. You yeah. know it, like it's an entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. So you're like, how, how hard would it be for you to go to work I'm for to- someone totally else? totally unemployable right It now. would never happen, <laughs> right? right? right. You wouldn't do Completely. it. You'd rather just I, yeah. live out of one of your trucks yeah, and I'm, actually oh, yeah. have I'm just going to be job. homeless for the rest of my life. Oh, overlanding, <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> same. Same, same, but, <laughs> same, same so, but different. So so we decided, uh, so we, were, we weren't necessarily looking for a way out. We were just seeing like the, the, the win- and also piracy was super bad. Oh, so this is before Netflix was streaming. Netflix was just still sending DVDs in the mail. And we were running out of places to sell stuff to. And as we were selling our movies, they were being stolen. Yeah. So, for example, we sold a movie to Russia. Russia gives you an advance. They say, hey, we're going to give you this money, and, you're gonna, and we're going to make our film elements for the movie theaters in Russia. And you're supposed to use that money to make the film elements. So they give you the deposit. And then they call a month later and they say, stop. Stop making the film elements um, because we don't need the movie anymore. Like, what do you mean? They're like, well, you can keep the deposit, but it's already released here. You know, like this just pirated. Yeah. So we lost our, our, our two thirds of the money. And, um, but that, that was happening in territory after territory. Yeah. And so the, the, the windows for where you could sell were closing. And the people that were stealing the movie weren't getting punished. You can find our movies on Google by typing the name of the movie in free. And it, you, didn't, you didn't need BitTorrent. You didn't need all this crazy software. You could literally press play, watch like a Tide detergent commercial, and then our movie would play. It would, and we couldn't get it off the internet. We no. literally yeah. couldn't do it. It was easier to steal it than it was to buy it. So we're making a living, and not a bad living, but we're like making a living of school teachers or whatever. Yeah. But we're making these movies that are quote unquote you know, successful, but we just can't monetize them properly. Yeah. Right. So we started thinking about this concept of well, what if we made something that was uh, like a widget, like something that was tangible that you could hold that couldn't be digitally stolen with the press of a button, with the, with the you know, the, the flip of a switch or the move of a mouse. Um, and so right around that time, Tina's dad, who had a, a, a piece of front runner, 
um, in South Africa was like, we're looking for some help in America. Are you guys interested? We're like, no way. Like, we're, you know, we make we're, movies. We're, we're not artists. We're going to make you know? roof racks. We, yeah, why would we do that? That's crazy. That's, you know. Um, but as the like a year went on, we're kind of like, that could be the widget we were talking about. Yeah. Like, we had the entrepreneurial bug because we raised money, we sold products, we were telling stories, um, you know, hiring people. We, we started the day with nothing and made this tangible thing at the end of the day. And we realized that that's what we got a lot of joy out of. Sure. Not the fact that it was actually a movie, maybe, or not the fact that it was writing the music, but the fact that we had nothing. And at the end of the year, we yeah, made something. something for the world. Yeah, you know? sure. Um, so I think we started wrapping our heads around this concept that maybe that would work with a roof rack business, yeah. right? And you but could what be creative about building a brand, building starting with story. nothing and saying, "Here's we can make something." It wasn't a movie, yeah. but it was a, a brand, right? And no and, one would comment on the third act. And <laughs> right, <in laughs> no theory, one would right? have a problem with it. Like it is what it is. And it's little, made out of aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> little, did, little did you know that people will still find. Oh, a they way. will still oh, find always. a way. They'll yeah, there's always somebody, s- yes. something to complain about. Yeah. You mean you used a 12 millimeter? <laughs> right. <Alan Ed>? Like <laughs> who would use a 12 millimeter? I'm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of that yeah, um, in the weeds. But we we spent about a year like just doing a study of the market. Like who else is out there? And what are they doing and how are they marketing it? Why would we be able to step into this market Space, yeah. and, and create something with it? So we did a lot of those SWOT analyses of uh, like whatever. You know, oh, we're, yes. not, we're not business people, by the way. We think we're pretty practical yeah. and we have common sense enough to maybe um, um, uh, mirror like what some successful people are doing. You know, So you can kind of look at the market and say, like, that's cool. That makes sense. Or they're very successful doing that. And so we kind of pieced together this idea of what we could do with Front Runner in America. And, and basically it was pretty simple. At the time, it was maybe a little revolutionary. Now it seems so common, but we basically took a roof rack accessory company and made it a lifestyle brand. Yeah. That was the goal. Yeah. We're going to get people using this gear. We're going to tell people that you need this piece of auto hardware and to, sell to the have dream. the life of your dream. Yeah. To have no one was Instagram doing that. Instagram photo of your dreams. Yeah, exactly. and that was even before Instagram yeah, was even sort of right. a, yeah. a thing. So we, we were at the beginning of all the social, at the beginning of saying, let's tell a story with a roof rack, which no one was doing at the time. Yeah. yeah and you guys, did a, um, you guys did an absolutely fantastic job of that. And everyone that's listening knows of Front Runner and they know of the brand. They probably have seen a lot of your, yeah. your advertisements. And you, Front Runner, to its credit, always made really practical good. Well, yes, they and made, it was easy because you had a product that you could really get behind yeah, and you they could made say, an honest this product, is yeah. the best roof yeah, rack. Yeah, we actually felt it was the best. It was. And, you know, with our new business, when we had to get some other roof racks and try them out, I kept I just like, oh my God, this is terrible. Like, <laughs> the front runner really is the best. Like, just reminding myself yeah. that yeah. <laughs> as I tried to assemble these other things or look at these terrible fitment guides or missing pieces... Yeah, it was not difficult to get behind no, to, 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 that. Yeah. Well, and you guys did a, an incredible job with that. And you built the business up. And then you guys, as a family, and this is what this is such an interesting thing for us to talk about in the podcast today, is you guys, you build up the business. Everything's running. You guys did a great job. And then you decide, we are going to take some time for our family. And we're going to go see part of the world. And you guys loaded up. A Land Rover LR3 is that yep. right? Yep. Of all things, um, and <laughs> snob. <laughs> no, well, no, it's not that. It's bra- bravery, right? <laughs> bravery, bravery, bravery or brave. stupidity? Cur- cur- courage, <laughs> courage, <laughs> courage or stupidity? We're not sure. <laughs> so, so what? What inspired you guys to to make this decision that we have this? moment in time to go see this part of the world with our family and our kids. There are three things, I believe. So one was, you know, we're selling this gear and you want to sort of live the live the, live brand. the brand a little bit. And, yeah. we, and while we had traveled in Africa that way and we took, you know, we took our, our, our two young boys on like a dinosaur themed, you know, overland trip in America, yeah. you know, just camped for three weeks and went to all the dinosaur places in Wyoming. And, you know, awesome. and so that was fun. And, and so we did, did a lot of dispersed camping, but we keep on hearing about these trips that everyone's taking. And we're like, fuck, you know, like we didn't, we didn't get into the business to take a vacation. We know a lot of people are in, let's say the overlanding space to, to have an excuse to take vacations. <laughs> yeah, sure. But we also felt like we need to use the gear and like really live it. So that was yeah. one reason. I think we'd always also wanted to do something like that with the kids. Yeah. Like a long-term kind of trip and show them other normals. We didn't, at that time, really have the plan to do it or know where we wanted to do it. I think we felt at that point in time, 
oh my gosh, like if we do do this, we're going to have to do it soon. They're old enough now where we can take them on a trip where they'll remember, but they're also young enough where they still kind of want to be with their parents yeah, sure. and sure. and we won't be tearing them away from their friends and school's not that demanding because they're in elementary school. And so the the timing of it yeah. spoke to that. And then I think... All this digital nomad talk was kind of like, well, we set up the ship. The ship's sailing with Front Runner. We yeah. could probably step away, run our meetings, put in two full days digitally, and then, and then and stay connected digitally. Yeah. Um, so we felt that wouldn't be a huge problem. We wanted to build that life for ourselves. That was part of, it's part of working for yourself, right, Scott? You know, exactly. You're saying, taking a trip for work, you know? And so that kind of felt like it was justifiable. Um, then the fires happened in Malibu. Yeah. So we were kicked out of our house for almost 10 days, um, and we thought our house was maybe going to burn down. So this is a house we had just built. It was uh, all our possessions. We thought, really thought that we were going to lose everything. And so when we came back, we were kind of like, who cares? Like, what about, who cares about this stuff? We don't need this stuff. We, you know, we, this, you become it was a less, lot less precious yeah, just about kind of felt, things. And we were less precious to the point where we said, let's just rent this house out. Like, let's do it now because there's 600 families that lost their homes in the Malibu area who could use a place to live. And we talked to a Brilliant. real estate agent friend, and right away she brought a couple over who had just had a baby a young and a small, family, and they yeah. were super cool, and they were front runner customers. You know, they saw me wearing <laughs> my front runner so crazy. jersey, and uh, and they just had just purchased something the week before, and so we rented the house to them for six months. The insurance company paid for everything up front, so basically right away we're like, oh my god, the trip is covered. Yeah, because that's they our were, budget. They said to us, they said we can give you the whole six months lease up front because the insurance is paying while we rebuild. And Dave and I looked at each other and we were like, we're going to do this. We have to so, do this now. And that was like a push out the door. I don't think it's as They were moving in in easy. one month. We had one month to pr prepare. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons we took the LR3. It wasn't like we were going to go shopping for a truck and no. build it out. Yeah. And uh, we had a Tundra we could have taken, which I think would have been too big in too the colonial big. cities. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We had a very old series. We would not have taken that. No, that's we like had driving our, a sewing machine. fancy scout. That would not have made sense on the road. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, those were our choices. I so think. the LR3 was the choice. And we had a month and we were like, let's go south. Like we're gonna do, we're gonna do I the Americas, and let's go south. I remember you said that you didn't know where you were gonna go. We didn't how far really you were know, go. no. And and Dave had like picked out a couple towns along the way in Mexico and Guatemala and Nicaragua and Central America and then South America a little bit, but um, places we wanted because we wanted to actually live in these places and not just pass through for a few days. So the plan was to actually live in some of these cities that we thought would be great to explore for at least a month at a time. Oh, I see. So yeah. we planned it for like six months. We're going to go south. We'll see how far we get. The We had a loose plan of we're going to probably ship the vehicle back from Panama yeah. just because of the Darien Gap. And, and if we want to do, you know, South America... We'll do that another way. But um, so the plan was to get to, at the time, I mean, we were like Ecuador or bust, I think. Right. We, uh, yeah, we, we took the LR3. We put front runner gear on it, nodding, a tent. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a fridge. We had a toilet. We had expander chairs. We had a drawer system. We had our four duffel bags, our computers, you know, some camera gear. And that was pretty much it. One yeah. of the drawers in the drawer system, they were locking. We had our like computer and camera stuff, and one had camping gear. And we lived out of it just fine yeah. for, for well, four, four and a half months was the, was the trip. Yeah. So we lived in Oaxaca for a month, which is fantastic. Oh, it was the highlight of the trip. My heart is there. I think if you had asked me before the trip, like, where do you think you're going to you know, most connect with or love the most. And I had the sense that the further south we went and the more exotic it got, that's what would appeal to me the most. Yeah. But having lived in Oaxaca, I have to say my heart is in Oaxaca. Yeah. It is just the most, the food, the people, the Culturally, colors, it actually got more, the music. it actually got more generic the further south yes. you that go. You experience. end up in Panama and you're like, I'm in Florida. Yeah. So, so the best <laughs> part, the best part is the closest to us. Yes. And it's the least sort of explored or, or almost known about or seems the most foreboding. So, Everyone will gladly hop on a plane to Costa Rica, but right. people aren't going to hop on a plane and go to Guanajuato or, Which you should, or Mexico by the way. City or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like. So we, help people know where Oaxaca is in reference. So it's south of Mexico City, maybe about a five-hour And it's drive. on the coast? Well, so Oaxaca well, is like a state. A big and so province. Part, part of it's on the coast, but yeah. we stayed in Oaxaca City. Okay. That's where, the, that's where um, what's the movie? Coco? 
Yes. It's sort of like that Pixar movie. Like if yeah. that's sort of, that's basically where God, it took it's place. It's like Coco. It's where it's all like, the, it's the fountain of all the culture in Mexico. It's all yeah. the great the food, the mezcal, amazing. the mole, the, mm-hmm. um, the, the nieves, the, they have this ice cream there that is off the hook nuts that, that, that doesn't exist in America. It's, it's, <laughs> it's street it, ice cream. It is unbelievable. Um, we, we figured our, our tour was all about the people and the food. Yeah. yeah. You know, the camping was like almost a, a second or a third or a fourth even, you know, as, as a priority. Um, well, I mean, and th- that's the key thing about overland travel is that you can overland around the world and never camp and still be an overlander. You of don't, course, yeah. you don't have to four wheel. No, you don't have to go right. off road. You don't have to camp, uh, and you can still very much be overlanding. Um, and and I we think actually felt the gear. It wasn't a hindrance. Like we never got robbed because of the gear, but we definitely felt like we stood out, or we definitely looked like here are the tourists because you pull yeah. up. And even though the LR3 is small, it didn't have a ton of gear hanging off of it. And we yeah. weren't particularly flashy looking. No, but it did have two jerry cans which we never touched. One had fuel, one had water, which, yeah. which is I guess I think when you head out to an unknown, you want you feel of course, safe, of course, right. Feeling prepared. But we never once even began to reach for either of those things. Yeah. No. Um, and, uh, and then, There's and, good infrastructure. Yeah, and then yeah. if you looked in the car, if you kind of peered in, you'd see some duffel bags, but you couldn't see the drawer system. So we were pretty low-key, low, low key, yeah. I think. Um, but you're right. We, uh, and did we, you guys do some language immersion or did you? Tried. So I went to, yeah, I went to Spanish classes. I took the kids to Spanish classes. I was convinced I was going to come back <laughs> habla espanol, like brilliantly. <sighs> so embarrassed it's so bad i, I it's cannot. so easy to travel with apps yeah right and, so and you can book anything you can use your eye overlander to just see if that place is safe if you want to camp and in the too whatever many it's people so, speak english and do. so when i would say you know yo necesito practicar mi español and they'd say i need to practice my english <laughs> and you're like no and you default to the easy thing which is sure english sure yeah. english yeah um, but it's so it's so and it's so easy to travel in a bubble so the important thing for us is how do you get out of the bubble like how do you just not stay with the, like us and our kids in our little car and how do you get out and try to it's hard to try to actually meet people because you are a tourist yeah. yeah right so you can't go to the museum and like befriend the the <laughs> ticket taker at the museum and, and have them invite you over for dinner because that's actually what you really want yeah. <laughs> right yeah so um so it's important for us to kind of figure out a way to meet people but and what helped that was the duration in the places right so that if you're there not just for a few days yeah. and like in oaxaca we were staying just in a little neighborhood outside of oaxaca city and we had met this family that were the extended family of the guy who was owning the airbnb that we had chosen and this airbnb was this beautiful little hacienda that he was from oaxaca he had met a girl who was american they um lived in washington and washington state like um outside of seattle and had this beautiful family home that he'd built there. But when we arrived, it was his sister, her kids, his brother, the abuela, the grandmother. Everyone was there when we arrived at the Airbnb, and they became family like a host friends. Family. And yeah, we would have an barbecues at Chamin's house down the street. And he introduced the kids to the cultural center where they took trumpet classes or marimba classes or art. And we got to be immersed in this. And I think that's a large part of why my heart's in Oaxaca is because I feel like I have family there to a degree in that they were so welcoming. And it also reminded me a lot of the South African mentality. Like South Africa is a place where I really feel like people open their homes to strangers. They do. And you don't have to call ahead or you know you drop in on people in South Africa and that's just completely expected and you can you know drop in and people can drop in on you and I felt like Mexico and Oaxaca particularly had the same it felt it felt very much like home to me yeah because the family, of that the family structure there is so impressive it's so impressive and then and then it's also that whole sort of mother to one mother to all so you know you are instantaneously family like i remember jack had his 11th birthday our oldest had his 11th birthday there and chamin came over and he was laughing at where i had put the pinata and he was like no no and he went and like tied it to a lamppost and stood on the roof and he was like that's not where you put and he was like oh and what a gringo party just the one pinata he's like a mexican party we've got like 10 pinatas like what's wrong with you people (laughs) and they were super embarrassed because we purchased a flan and we couldn't find we love flan we couldn't find a place to get flan and tina found one at a Walmart and then our, our sort of friend host family they were very uh, 
judgmental. Yeah, we didn't ask them where to get the right flan, so yeah. somehow we ended up at a Walmart. And then I got one at the Tlacalula market. Is that the one that fell out of the fridge? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was so sad. So, so yeah, like I said, our trip was based on food and food disasters. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember, like the day Kennedy was shot, when that flan, when that fell flan out of the hit the fridge floor. <laughs> it was like 9-11 in our house. Uh, it crying over spilt milk. Yeah, Everybody then we, we stayed in Merida, which apparently we read a stat that it's the second safest city in North America after Quebec City. And we love Merida. It's not on the ocean. It's the capital of the Yucatan and fantastic. Yeah, That's where amazing. We, yeah, and, and then when we asked why Merida is so safe, um, a friend who we'd made there explained to us that all the cartels send the children and the grandparents to Merida. And as you know, you don't mess with the family. Yeah, that's right. So no one messes with Merida. Yeah. Merida's like the place. There's a couple of private schools and, mm-hmm. you know, nice um, neighborhoods. It's like the safe zone. Yeah. It is. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And then, so you went from there into Belize? We did. We did. Uh, that, then our Land Rover broke down. We had, our, <laughs> we had the air suspension, which we didn't swap out to coils ahead of time. We mm-hmm. just thought, well, if it happens, it happens. We'll deal with it. And it happened. And we were stuck riding uh, with the truck yeah. you know, <laughs> on, the, on the stumps or whatever. It was on the, not on the, comfortable. Uh, uh, but we, yeah, Belize, which we didn't love. Uh, it was very, it felt not scammy. It just, I, we know the stories of like McAfee and like, it just, yeah. it just felt like everyone was running from something and it mm. didn't. It was very strange. We didn't, we didn't go there to dive. We didn't snorkel. We didn't do any ocean things. We were just, we were inland a bit. But it's also a country surrounded by Latina countries and yet they speak English there. Yeah. And that's the language. And they're tra- they tr- do transactions with the dollar. Yes, yeah. and it didn't feel... Yeah. It just didn't culturally, I, I didn't know, like, you couldn't glob on to, like, what is Belize? Yeah. It felt very touristy almost. It is. You know, yeah, and, it and it was, it was just strange. Like, a lot of, like, women in, like, burlap things, blondes with blonde children. and A lot of Mennonites, Mennonites. a lot of orphanages. Um, it was just it a weird It felt it weird culty. Country. It felt culty and it felt strange. Well, we met a cool Land Rover guy from South Africa who yeah. had a shop who yes. couldn't, couldn't fix our truck. So we start, we're starting on our journey now of meeting people through having to get our vehicle repaired. <laughs> well, I should also... I, <clears throat> he was I, by the border, right? Yeah, was, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. In, in uh, San Ignacio. Oh, yeah. In, yeah. Yes. I've, I've been there. Yeah, and yeah. It's, that guy San is Ignacio. So, that guy is so funny because... <laughs> When I, I'm talking to him and he's talking about the Camel Trophy and he's, he was very judgmental of our vehicles, <laughs> right? That they weren't they, that they weren't Land Rovers. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere. And I said, man, I said, I know I have met you somewhere, and I'm expecting him to say, well, I was in the Camel Trophy or I was whatever. And I'm like, did you ever work at a Land Rover dealership in Southern California? Yes. Yeah. And he's like. Yeah. And it was like I just like took like deflated, the veil. deflated. Yeah, like, yeah. He, he was, was at like, the service center. Yeah. yeah, he was like a car salesman yeah. for forty years. Yeah. you know, and yeah. so it, it. But at least it helped me understand like the context of yeah. this. You know, he yeah. Was yeah. Like that. yeah. No, he was very helpful. And then um, actually, when we were broken down, we broke down in a beautifully picturesque place it's called Punta Alen it's yeah. past Tulum right at the end there and I mean if you were going to break down anywhere that yeah. was the place to do it and we actually got a hack a trick from Justin at Lucky 8 yeah um, I called him and he was like okay you, you're going to be able to trick the suspension in order to get out of there without the tow truck because that was you basically remove a certain fuse and you jack up the front and the back and you trick the computer to thinking it's fine right and then basically you have as long as the leak is yes. until it like lowers again and sure. then you have to do the trick again yeah. so we'd get like you know three or four hours of driving out of it until it was kind of undrivable again then you basically do the hack yeah. jack it up yeah. the front and the back you know because the choice at the time the was either to go back to merida yeah. backwards or to carry on and get to guatemala city where there was a land rover dealership there sure. so we we ended up you know, doing the bumpy ride to Guatemala. Um, and yeah, I, I must say like we saw, I mean, throughout Mexico, we saw all the ruins and it was they're incredible. spectacular. Yeah, they're incredible. My children will say they were ruined with ruins <laughs> <laughs> because we saw all of them. And then Tikal in Guatemala yeah, is incredible. just so it's so Indiana Jones where you literally walking through the jungle and happen upon a temple. It's yes. just incredible. Um, and yeah, and then we got to Guatemala and we got to Guatemala City and um, the Land Rover dealership 
was just so expensive and they and when I told them the trick and I was showing them and that they had to jack it up from the chassis and, and I mean all these mechanics just were like fainting with this idea that you could trick the electronics and we actually met another friend of a friend we met a guy named Byron Sanchez who was friends with Angie and James uh, Angela yeah, sure. and James Brown sure and um, he put us in touch in Antigua, Guatemala, with the most phenomenal dude named Bill who has, I mean, if anyone loves Land Rovers, he has a Land Rover heaven. Yeah. Um, he would say, well, it's a shop, but it's almost yeah. like a graveyard, but they probably all work, but it's yeah. maybe 30, 40 Land Rovers of all sorts. Sure. And Bill was, um, he took one look at the LR3 and said, yeah, I don't touch the ones with computers. That'll be my son. Willie will do that. <laughs> I'm not going to touch anything with electronics. No, Willie had just taken some some air suspension, whatever, the pods or whatever, out yeah. of another truck, a guy who was converting to coils, and he sold us those super cheap and put them in. It took a week or two. Yeah. But, but, but his but daughter... But you were in Antigua for a week Yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no we were in Antigua, <laughs> yeah. which was amazing. We were of there course. during... Semana Santa, which was oh this God. insane, insane um, religious um, festival. festival. Yep. And um, Bill's daughter actually did these tours where she'd take you on a defender to Pacaya Volcano. Oh, wow. And we, then you get on horseback or you can walk it. Dave walked it. We, I went on a horse. Um, and you go up to the lava and we roasted marshmallows <laughs> on hot lava, which I've ruined my children. I mean, I've de definitely ruined them. Like, they can't we're, roast we're, we're, we're camping now and they're like, where's the lava? <laughs> where's the lava for the we marshmallows? We don't want to use wood. <laughs> you get this perfect crispiness, right? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Nothing like a lava roasted. <laughs> oh, incredible. And then and then you guys continued south. And what, what did you find were some of the highlights after you left Guatemala, you went into, then you went in, into Honduras. Did you go through Copan? Yeah, or did we did you Copan. Do, did you do the... But then we, we popped Copan. back out and then went back through Guatemala into El Salvador. Yeah. We met so there's three borders in one day. That was an interesting day. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you were to drive, if you wanted to drive from Los Angeles to Panama, you could, it's like a little bit further than driving from Los Angeles to New York City. Yeah. So you could probably do it in three or four or five days, you know, if you were putting these eight, 10 hour days. But we always tried to keep the days to four or five hours. We didn't want to make it like we're doing this long haul trip. Yeah. Expedition. We always tried to drive in daylight. We never did a from city to city at night, never. We just were like, there's no reason to. There's no yeah. point. And then um, we found that that was our biggest day. It was an eight hour day, which for us at that time, that was huge, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. to get through the three borders and or the, yeah, the in and out. And um, in El Salvador, we stayed in El Tunco, uh, Playa El Tunco. Oh, uh, which that was we, we, we also found that a lot of the surf towns where there were expats you know who were there for the waves yeah they always usually had the right blend of culture and what's what's that that balance that blend you're always a little looking bit of for. convenience yeah. yeah yeah like the authentic like there's a local authentic kind of ness to a place and then there's also an ease of navigation where where there's a little bit of because it's a surf town there's a little bit more um you can access you can access the local people yeah. much more than than not. I think I don't know that we'd have the same opinion of El Salvador if we weren't in this little surf town. Yeah, you know. So we're at this hotel yeah. and um, uh, we're out by the pool, and uh, a guy runs um, to the pool, and he's like, "Who has the truck with the California plates?" Like speaking very. Uh, really good English, English yeah. um, but he's El Salvadorian, and we're like, oh, that's us. Like, we don't know if we're getting in trouble or if he's going to rob us. And he's like, oh, I'm Oscar. I own the hotel. It turns out Oscar used to live in Los Angeles. Oscar used to run a neon sign repair company, but he has since moved back and started a family in his hometown. So he owns this hotel and a coffee shop. But he was awesome because we got now a firsthand sort of totally. El Salvadorian experience about the Civil War, about how he ended up in LA when he was 14, um, and he took us out um, spear fishing the next day. Uh, uh, the boys and I. And and, Unbelievable! Uh, and they had an amazing time. We caught so much fish, and Jack was underwater with a spear, and just like just a friend, like a, just a, a, yeah. a dude we met. So that was yeah. that was actually one of the highlights of the and trip. He, just and connecting he's become with. a good friend. And and I think also like, oh my god, the boys they so Oscar they got a Goliath grouper. Oh yeah, the fish They're was gigantic, literally yeah. bigger than Ford. Yeah. it was bigger than our younger kid. Um, yeah, no, it was a spectacular time. And again, it was that sense of just like you felt like you had family or friends there like I feel like Oscar's just 
a part of our family yeah. and we shared so much and it was such a short time but it was intensely meaningful and memorable yeah. and I, and have, he had have, a, a son friends. who was the same age as Jack right so. we, have, we have friends that are experts on neon signs or scholars in that <laughs> in that space and they just wrote a definitive book about neon signs we just sent that to Oscar oh, last yeah. week so we're you know we maintain these try to maintain these friendships around the world um, in in Oaxaca one of the reasons we wanted to stay there was for the mezcal and we tried all the different distilleries and at some point I was like I got to find what people consider the best mezcal while we're here. Yeah. And I looked online and there was a list of like Brooklyn bartenders say this is the best mezcal. I'm like, Brooklyn? The hipsters. That must be good. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we, we, we decided to drive to the ranch because they, they had no website or something. It wasn't open to the public, but we drove there and we, we parked and we saw them brewing the mezcal. We saw the big vats. We saw them burning the, the cactus, the, 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 the roots. The, yeah. and, um, and, but none of them spoke English at all. And our Spanish is so terrible. <laughs> I didn't even know how to say, a, do do a tour or, you know, tasty mezcalo. Like, we didn't know how to say we wanted to taste it. And so we walked around. The kids were playing with the goats and the chickens. And, and we hung out there a little bit. And at some point, a woman came up who said, oh, do you want to, you know, try mezcal in broken English? And we're like, oh, we would love to. Thank you. And she brought us into the house, like the, the, the residential house on the property. And that's a guy, a guy walks out, and his name is Eduardo, but they call him Lalo, and he spoke perfect English. Also, lived in L.A., was a gardener <laughs> for five years, saved up all his money so he could take his family's recipe. He does ancestral mezcal and started this distillery. So he proceeds to f feed us <laughs> mezcal. Oh, and then also tortillas <laughs> that made from the corn on his farm and a coffee that I've never tasted, such an amazing coffee that he was brewing just on a fire that was like a sweet with cinnamon and spices. And it was one of the most magical days. So to this day, our, our favorite sipping mezcal is this Lalo Cura, which you can find Lalo rare. Cura. Lalo yes. Cura. You can find it very randomly. Yeah. It's at one restaurant in LA where you can walk out with a bottle. There's a Oaxacan restaurant called Madre, and they actually sell the bottles, and they sell, and I think they even have like an exclusive on one of, because his big thing and what we learned with him was he was like, yeah, the smoky taste of mezcal, is actually just a marketing ploy, and it really shouldn't taste. Well, that's well, a mistake. He, he, he called it a mistake. He says it's a mistake it's over... for it to taste smoky because then you won't be able to tell which maguey, which cactus plant you're sipping because it masks sure. the taste of the plant, and so it should be clear and it should not have a smoky taste. You should be able to taste that cactus, like that maguey. You should be able to taste it, and so I was super upset because I love the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it was very. I like the smokiness too. In fact, that's like my new jam is like a yeah. is like a mescal negroni. Mm. Oh, nice! nice. It's, it's kind of it's kind of magic. So. Yeah. So we so um, and then in Nicaragua we stayed in San Juan del Sur for a month, and uh, that was fantastic. We have friends there that own a cigar. Angela business, and James Brown, um, yeah. right? And, and they've been in the community for a long yeah, time. Yeah, they, they lived. They were in Antigua for a while, and and we met them at the first Overland Expo that we participated in, or like the third or second Overland Expo there ever was. Yeah, we met Angie and James. Yeah. So they've been friends almost as long as you. And our um, kids, our kids, Jack, our oldest, and their son Parker were, I think, about four or five years old when they met. And so it was great when we were staying there. I mean, Jack and Parker could hang together. And it was one of the first places where they could actually go to school. The boys went to school in San Juan del Sur um, for, I think it was maybe a month. Um, and that was, that was just a lovely time. We got to see Angie and James have a factory in Esteli where they have, um, it's called, um, Oveja Negra, which is the... Shout out to Black Label. That's the name of their Yeah, Black Label is the name of their the their cigar brand. But they also have a tobacco factory where they roll cigars for other labels. Oh, and sure. so Black Sheep is actually their tobacco company and nice. their factory in Esteli. And yeah, it was interesting too, because Esteli is obviously very, very different from San Juan del Sur. San Juan del Sur is a little surf town. There's a lot of expats there. Um, it's on the ocean. Esteli is very much a working town, and it's sure. where a lot of the tobacco stuff and factories are. Sure. So that was that was fascinating. And then you guys complete this trip. You get to you get to Panama, also known as yeah, Florida. Yeah, we, we were a little. Yeah. I wouldn't say we were overlanded out, but being the the male responsible member of the vehicle and keeping everything from being, let's say, stolen or whatever I was or worried broken. about or breaking down. You know, I just, I was a little stressed out, like just always, I wouldn't say I was worrying about the truck, but the truck was, 
you know, it was, it was the heart of everything. So when we got to Panama, we were we we could have shipped it to, into South America. We had a we had now six weeks left, or we could have shipped it back to um, Los Angeles. And the prices were kind of the same to ship it to South America or ship it back. And we just felt at that time, let's just bail on the truck. Let's just well, finish. Also, let's, let's let's just the things we wanted to see in South America were kind of far apart. Also, so to to do that sort of in an overlanding way, we would have needed another two in, three months. Yeah, and we only had six weeks, so we didn't feel like we would be able to see everything we wanted to see in that time if we were driving it yeah so we um we also i will say this panama was a huge surprise to us i did not think i would like panama i did not you know i loved panama city yeah. i loved casco viejo the old totally. part it is so beautiful great restaurants i love exactly great restaurants great food great people totally um and so panama is actually a little bit of a surprise because you are expecting it to be more of a miami and while there is that aspect to it and it's very easy to navigate, of totally. course, because of that. But at the it, same it, I time... I think it's very Western. So after four and a half months of not being in a mall or something, right. suddenly they're, that was like, oh they're my also, God, a mall. <laughs> they're, they're like really well, they're squared away. I yes. mean, that, yes. the, the Panama Canal has to be organized right. and squared away. Right. And I think that permeates to the society in that region of right. Panama. It's like, it's just pretty squared away. It we we took the away. old-timey train from Cologne to Panama City. It was fantastic. Oh. We were the only ones on this turn of the century train it was the train that was more or less built to go along the panama Canal. it was magnificent and uh yeah it was great and then and yeah i mean panama, panama we'll go back to panama yeah it's uh it's easy to get around and there's pockets you can get lost in you know yeah. like the the bocas del toro region um in the north part is fantastic um yeah and so yeah so we decided to fly into into south america we did cartagena we did um bogota we did um lima, lima. we did cusco we did Perfect. um Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. We had a great time in Alente Tambo, which is a little oh. village near, on, uh, along the, uh, the tr it's like a train stop away from yep. Machu Picchu. Right. And um, we, we ended up spending an extra few weeks there. We, had, we really Yeah, we were meant to be there for like three days, but this town, it has running water like through the whole town sure. all the, the time. Uh, in the streets. In, in the, the streets. In it's the little, like little, little, I don't know, aqueducts. It's the only, actually, the only Aztec village that's like still pretty much happening as oh, a gotcha. as, working village as right. a working, very very narrow streets cars can't fit in them all cobblestone and, and also we met someone there and then yes. because we befriended wendy um it felt easier to stay there so wendy is an american who came there in the 70s and started a little backpacking tourism business with her husband and uh she ends up now she's owning or owns the, the kind of the fancy hotel that's built into the train station yeah yeah um and uh so wendy was fantastic she's an artist now and, um, and she lives in lima most of the time but her son has an amazing restaurant in this little town in the sacred valley which um alanta tambo and it's called uh Kuncho? Chuncho? Chuncho. It, chuncho. Chuncho. And it's all authentic. Um, Home style. Peruvian food. Oh, wow. Because what would happen is, because everyone's going to Machu Picchu, a lot of the restaurants in this little town would make pizza. Terrible, yeah. terrible pizza sure. for the tourists. And her son was like, you know, we all go home to these amazing Peruvian home-cooked meals that our mothers make. Like, why are we feeding these people pizza? Yeah. We should be showing them that food. Yeah, sure. And that was what was amazing about his restaurant. And yeah, she they have a distillery on in the hotel. They have a little farm yeah. and a school and a distillery and there's a guy making um like gins and things but from Andean like plants. Botanical uh, sure. botanic yes, yeah, so it's all like indigenous Sounds ingredients yummy. and he's making like a mock gin or a mock it's unbelievable what these people are doing they're so special just Amazing. special yeah well let me let me ask you um this trip a trip like this with your family is usually pretty transformative so what did you feel like that you guys learned as a family at the end of this what did you take away well what was really interesting is when we got back six months later 
in California, we had lockdown for COVID. Yeah. So Dave and I looked at each other and we looked at everyone and we're like, Not no, again. no, 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 we've done this. We've done the homeschooling. <laughs> we've done the close quarters and family time. We're like, no, because when we got back, everyone said, you know, how was it in such close quarters for so long and the homeschooling and everything else? And we, were, we didn't know we'd get to say, you'll see for yourself without <laughs> yeah. the exotic travel. It's not all that. In, in hindsight, um, we wouldn't have done the homeschooling. So we were very, yes. we were very like structured, like, all right, they have to, they have to follow along with their friends back home. They have yeah. to get through with this math by this week. Khan so a lot, Academy. Of, a lot of the days were like pulling aside where there was good internet and just having them get through their homework and making sure they were reading stuff. And there were fights and tension and just sort of like, it just. Which in hindsight, like a lot of the days couldn't start until they'd finished their schoolwork and really we should have tossed that from the start. Like they were learning way more of course, that they yeah. would have in a classroom. They would have caught up just fine. Um, my advice would be like, just ditch the school side of it. The, the school's just a part of their life education for that amount of time, for six months at that stage. I mean, fifth grade and second grade, you know, if they can count to a thousand and read a book, <laughs> like just get over yourself, they'll yeah. catch up, you know. And so I think we would have ditched that. I also feel like, because, you know, we ended, we actually, we, we also got to do the Amazon. We got to do the Galapagos. I mean, things on people's bucket lists and our own bucket lists. But what happens is I think while you're doing it all at once, you become super complacent. Yeah, like we're like, oh, another yeah. beautiful colonial town. Yeah. Or we were sitting in the Galapagos and I'm like, guys, we're in the Galapagos. Like most people, this is the destination. Like this is part of our trip, but this is the destination. Like we need to, you know, savor, we're in the Galapagos. And so I think even my advice would be, why do it all at once? Yeah. Maybe it's better, you know, in America with kids, they get three months off during yeah. the summer go live somewhere for three months yeah, at a time back. each year. You could go and really take advantage of a place for a good month or two months or three months and not have to, because even, even though we gave ourselves the time of staying in these places for longer than a month, um, I think you probably get more value out of breaking it up so that you're not just getting complacent or mm. get, uh, you're not, it's not special enough. Mm. I, 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 I don't know. How would you explain it, Dave? No, that's good. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you guys have, you've been together a long time and you've traveled together a lot. Tina, what, what do you find that you, you, what do you find most impressive about Dave as a traveler? What, do you, what have you learned from Dave? Well, that's number one. That was an amazing thing, I think. I, I, I'd never really thought about it, but looking back, Wherever we were and whenever we decided we were moving on, Dave and I were never at odds that way. Like we were both ready to like, okay, we're done here or we're on to the next thing. It was never like, oh no, I really want to stay much longer. Why do we need to go? You know, we were totally in sync, I think, the whole trip. We, we always felt like enough time was spent where it was spent. Um, Dave is an incredibly mature and patient human being. And I have none of that. <laughs> <laughs> I am the most impatient person, I think. With but track. that's the joy about traveling with Tina. She's not afraid to ask questions. If there's a line, we were in Paris once and uh, <laughs> there was like, uh, we were going to Notre Dame or something. There was like one really long line and then one really short line. I walk right into the long line. I'm like, this is where I belong, the long line. <laughs> and Tina's like, why, why would, we don't even know what the short line is. Let's go to the short line. And I'm Mr. American nice guy. I'm like, I don't think we should stand in the long line. We go up to the short line and it was just a short line. <laughs> but, but literally it was like there were 400 people in one line and five in another. And, and a lot of people would think, well, that is for special people. Right. The five person line is for the people who have the tickets that right. are more money. And yeah, I, I just know my, that my I'm travel special. sense is like, I belong in that line. <laughs> and Tina believes she belongs in that line. I'm, I'm and actually special. that that's a, a, that's a <laughs> metaphor or, or it's a, it's a real story. But I'm saying it, it, it is a, she's easy to travel with in that she's happy to not not cut in line but get no. to the you know like like don't be question, a don't be a lemming yeah exactly. yeah don't be a lemming like you don't have to follow you don't have to yeah. follow you can try something new and then i think that's also like we would always find like amazing like this is the best taco place or this is the best um place for flan because 
I'm just never afraid of the hole in the wall. In fact, that's actually the attraction. Mm -hmm. Like if it looks too sort of, there's not enough locals in here, that food's gonna suck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know? It's the truth. So, so I think we we complement each other that way, and I think that's why we work together well. Is because we are so different. I sh I shoot from the hip. There, I think it, to answer your question, Scott, about what have you learned from Dave? Oftentimes, sleeping on it is a really good idea. <laughs> sleeping on it is a really really good idea. Any big decisions? Yes. Just give it. The give night. it the give night. It the night. Give it the night. Give it its time. You don't have to answer right the second. Yeah. And so I think that's that's something I've definitely definitely learned from Dave's temperament. Yeah. And how about, so different how about to mine. you, Dave? What have what has Tina taught you the most in all your travels together? Well, no, just this. Get the, in the, the short line. <laughs> get in the short line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid to question the norm. No, I mean, Tina walked around um, Mexico. She's not shy about giving people nicknames. She's not shy about trying out her Spanish. So she went around the first half of our trip telling everyone she was horny. <laughs> and she didn't realize that it's she was so using true. caliente wrong. Yeah, that's, so that's exactly what happened. I went, I, went to a, I went to a Spanish class in Merida, my first Spanish class. And I walked in and I said, yo soy caliente. And she said, I don't think you mean to say that. I was like, yes, I do. I am really hot. It's like boy. Out here. And she's like, yeah. And you would say that by saying, yo tengo calor. I take heat. Um, because when you say, yo soy caliente, what you're telling people is that you are horny. And I was like, oh my God. I, in the last four weeks, have told the lady at the ice cream shop. And and the thing is, and I, I also... I'm, I'm the cuck standing next door with a big smile on my face when my wife tell, is telling everyone she's horny. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not and satisfied. And the thing is, it also didn't even look like I was just some crazy gringo didn't know what she was saying because by that stage I had quite a good tan on yeah. I'm dark haired yeah. and I was really working on like a really good Spanish accent <laughs> so I literally looked like a girl who was just telling everyone how horny I was so Tina's not shy to dive into any yeah. experience which is great <laughs> but sometimes it would be better to sleep on it or take the Spanish class first <laughs> oh, it's, but it's so good to learn those lessons from each other and speaking of lessons, uh, we, we're going to come into the last couple of questions and some comments as the podcast comes to a close. But one of the things we really love to ask is what advice then would you give to the listeners? What, what have you guys learned in all of your travels? If, if someone was coming new and a family wants to go do what you guys are about to do, what would be the couple pieces of advice that you would tell them? It sounds like, don't worry about the schoolwork too much. Yeah. There's that, one. and I would also say to be open and optimistic and to, there's, you know, we had a lot of questions during the trip. Oh my God, you're taking your family through Mexico. How dangerous, isn't it dangerous? We were never met throughout the trip without hospitality and warmth. Yeah. That's how we were met. And I think it has a lot to do with also your attitude to it. If you're going to be skeptical, if you're going to be um, really weary or leery, or if you're going to be super flashy. I mean, Dave and I joke all the time with some of these enormous rigs. I'm like, some of those countries, I don't think you can go there because they're going to think you're coming to take over the country. <laughs> I mean, you it literally looks, look like... It looks like, like you're half, invading. Half yeah. the yes. trucks we saw at Overland Expo, I'm, thinking, I'm like, Nicaragua wouldn't even let that no, into the country. No, no yeah. that yeah. just looks like you're overthrowing the government. <laughs> you can't take a drone into Nicaragua. You can't take yeah. one of those trucks into Nicaragua. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that openness gave us all the amazing, the meaningful experiences we had was that we were not afraid and yeah. there was nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. I mean, of course, be sensible. We didn't drive at night. We didn't need to go and spend three days in Tepic or in places that, you know, have a reputation for. Yeah. But I, I saw a good one on Facebook while we were traveling. Someone said, you know, is it safe to drive through Mexico? And someone said, are you joining a cartel? Because <laughs> if you're not joining a cartel, yes, it's super safe to drive through Mexico. Yeah, so I think so that true. would be my advice is to, and, and, and you, you just need to get out the door. I that, know how hard it. getting out the door is. And we had that push with you the did. fires. Yeah. And there's no perfect time to buy a house. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect time to have a kid. And there's no perfect time to just start driving. 
Yeah. I mean, you're never going to get it all lined up. No, no. no. You just got to know that, like, I mean, maybe with if you have children, you have to know that if they're a little older, if they're in high school, they're not going to want to sit in a vehicle with you. Yeah. Um, the trip that we did, we did some off-roading stuff, but we never purposely planned on getting lost. You could do it at any vehicle, yeah. any two-wheel drive vehicle. I mean, yeah. we drove down to La Paz. It's all paved. We got on a ferry to Mazatlan. It's a, the ferry will take any vehicle. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mexico is all paved. I mean, every road you need to get on between all the major cities. Um, yeah, and once we were in South America, I mean, we, we didn't even have a vehicle, yeah. so and we managed to do a lot of that. You might bring a way. tent and some water and a sat phone for emergencies because you yeah. are in another country, um, but you don't even really need to camp. And between an app and you know Airbnbs and there's and hotels so cheap. everywhere, and, and they're so pen- cheap, yeah. so cheap, and that's where the great food is. Yeah, oh. you know, like nothing that I can cook is going to match what you're going to no. what you're going to get in a little shop in Mexico. No, oh, you no, could take exactly. you, could, you could drive in four days or five days of reasonable driving and be in Oaxaca. Stay there for a week and drive back in five days. It's yeah. a, it's a it's a it's an overland trip, but it's not this trip where you're like on an expedition and yeah. you're there mm-hmm. to save the world and go yeah. into villages and cure cancer or whatever. You're you're gonna you're going on a cultural trip and you're gonna see a lot because you're driving, but you yeah. don't need to have the perfect vehicle. Yeah, maybe you know? the lesson is don't wait. No, do it yeah. when you when you ever you can. Like in it our is. case, the opportunity was someone was going to rent our house. We felt comfortable renting it to them, and we suddenly had a budget that made sense. Yeah, um, we had you know the work thing wasn't perfect to to step away. We found that being a digital nomad is not exactly what it's chalked up to be. Yeah, it's the very, world very isn't difficult. quite ready. Yeah, it's very difficult for that. Um, yeah, the star the Starlink has changed. Yeah, that. I think very, that's a huge game changer about that. for sure. Right, for sure. And then um, another question we love to ask is, or I actually I love to ask because I always find new books to read, but for the two of you, has there been any books that you've read about travel or about anything else that, that you have really resonated with um, that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, if I'm traveling to a region that Paul Thoreau's written about, I'll read one of those books. So yeah. when I met Tina, I think even before the first time I went to Africa, I read Dark Star Safari. And I've been obsessed with this idea of traveling from Cape Town to Cairo yeah. um, by vehicle. And we've, we've almost gotten close to figuring out that we, you know, that we were going to do this trip. But it's also one of these things, it's just hard with the, with the kids and with the, and also it's, it's a hard trip a lot, to, lot it's a, time, it's yeah. a lot of time and um, dangerous if you do the East Coast, you know. Um, anyway, that that uh, Dark Star Safari is fantastic. Um, we were uh, supposed to uh, go on uh, to Tahiti. The trip, the plans changed, but I read his book about Oceania and the Pacific Islands, and he kayaked between all these islands. But yeah, he's great. Yeah, amazing writer for sure. Yeah. And Graham Bell's book, you just finished. Oh, and just really finished enjoyed. Graham Bell's book. I yes. think if you're taking any of these trips, you're going to do a longer overland trip. Definitely try to f- suss out a book written about that trip. Yeah. It'll just help dial in. Just you'll, you'll get a real feel of it even before you go and get the real f- feel of it. And I like that, that Graham always has a sense of optimism and he sees the place from a, like I think a really fair perspective. And yeah. He's a funny writer. And yeah. Graham's and, books are great because he'll, he'll kind of break down what the country's all about, what currency they use, yeah. how much gas costs a liter. So you kind of go into it like almost like a, like a lonely planet. Yeah. But then he tells a story about his family and where they camped and if the vehicle broke down and yeah. a little bit of history and politics. It's a nice, a nice blend. Yeah, I would say yeah. so. And how about for you, Tina? I often relied on Dave's researching, reading, because Dave has always done this. I mean, I remember we were going to Tanzania and he was reading the Green Hills of Kilimanjaro or what's it called? Oh, the Hemingway book. The Hemingway book. Um, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Close. There's something with Green Hills too. It might be another short story. Another book. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway. um, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not big on, on the, on. Tina's a listener. And a I'm, talker. Yes, and, well, you're yes, a storyteller, so yes, more, I'm, less yes, than a story I, reader. Yeah. It's better for Dave to tell me about the books. Um, <laughs> Dave tells me about the books. I, I like I was it. joking earlier today. I'm in a book club, and my group of book club girls, we're reading something called The English Understand Wool. It's about 65 pages long. <laughs> when it arrived in the mail, Dave was like, is this a book for one of the kids? <laughs> because... Um, <laughs> And I do like an audio book. Yeah, yeah. Me I too, do because sure. of, yeah, I'm not a big reader. And a lot of time driving, so it's fun to listen to an audio book. Yeah, and I don't, I don't retain the information the same way. If I, I'm, I, because I think I'm an auditory processor, I, if I hear it, 
Like I can remember a joke for a hundred years, sure. but if I read it, it's often gone. Like yeah. just a few weeks later, I don't have the ability to really hold on to the written stuff yeah. as much as if Dave tells me what the book's about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and in these podcasts, it's it's uh, we intentionally avoid talking much about what you guys do professionally. But I think that right. it is it is important. Um, to talk a little bit about the tent that you guys have come up with. And I think w the way that you guys relayed the story to me is that you've, you've camped in all of these different ways, roof tents and ground tents and sleeping in the vehicle and, and everything in between unicats, even all, all, yes, of, all, of, yes. it, all of it. We own an Airstream. Yeah, yes. exactly. So you guys have experienced a lot of these different um, ways of camping. And, and so I'm going to pitch it for you because um, and again, there's no sponsorship in this podcast of this product, but, um, I like the tent that you guys made. You guys happen to be close friends, but I do feel that this C6 rev tent that you guys have come up with is very, it's very unique. It can be used as a roof tent. There's a, there's an accessory that you guys produce that allows it to be used as a fold open roof tent on the, on a rack. It can be attached to a full length rack like a front runner rack it can be used in the back of a pickup bed it can be used on the ground and our team here paula our producer um and caleb next door we we lend out your tent all the time i use it personally anytime i'm in a test vehicle so a lot of times i need to go camping in a test vehicle i just chuck your tent into the back of it so it's a it's a 25 pound tent that folds up into its own case it's got a what is it? A four inch thick mattress yeah. mm -hmm. with a quilted cover on it. <laughs> you know, it's 800 bucks. Um, I think it's a really unique product. We've done a video on it. You guys can check it out on our YouTube channel, but talk for just a quick second. Cause again, we don't want this to be a sales pitch, but what inspired you guys to make this? Cause it's accumulation of a bunch of experience. It was, it was just traveling for eight years with a traditional rooftop tent. And yeah. we, we, you know, you know, like anyone when you're camping and you, you think you're smart, you're just like, wouldn't it be great if, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you just have these ideas. And at some point we just started when we started having relationships with factories overseas and started finding some good factories, we just thought, well, let's start, let's just for fun, see if we can make this dream tent. I yeah. think right. also, you know, if you think about what is a tent used for primarily, there's like three things. It's a shelter, it's for privacy, yeah. and it's for sleep. Yeah. And I think Dave and I thought, wow, everyone has really addressed the first two, yeah. but no one addresses comfortable sleep in a tent mm -hmm. in that you're just like, it's a given, oh, you're going camping, you're going to have a crap night's sleep. You just need to resign yourself to the fact that you're going to have a crap Or you're night's in an RV sleep. or you're in a fancy, yeah. sure. you know, clamshell. But as far as a tent's tent, yeah. concerned, air mattress or whatever else, it's just you re you've resigned, you've settled and it occurred to us, why should you have to settle on not having a comfortable night's sleep yeah. out in the middle of nowhere? Because if you're going mountain biking the next day, I think a lot of people would not camp the night before some big sort of adventure sport because they know they're going to have a crap night's sleep. Yeah. Well, that shouldn't be the case. You should be able to camp the night before that cycling thing or whatever um, surf thing you're like you should be able to do your adventure sport that next morning and you should be able to sleep comfy and not with a ruck in your butt from it, an air mattress <laughs> yeah and it is it is a super comfortable mattress but I think for me it's the utility of it because mm -hmm. I'm constantly changing how I'm traveling and so it's it's totally self supported in its own footprint. Right. So there's a freedom to that, yeah. Scott, so which I don't we, think we you have. Lot, we sell to a lot of people. They'll be like, I have a, 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 a pickup and I have a Defender, and I just want one tent that I can move around. Yeah. And they might put our platform on one of the vehicles and then just use it in the bed of the other. Um, we have five vehicles, and we camp. We actually camped out of all of them, including mm -hmm. the Tesla, and we can bring the tent on any of them. Yeah. As opposed to carrying five rooftop tents, this yeah. is sounding very privileged, but we, <laughs> yeah. because of work, we have different vehicles for different things, but yeah. we use it in the pickup, we use it on the LR3, we use it on the Scout. And um, frankly, I don't mind sleeping <clears throat> on the ground as long as oh. I have that four inch mattress. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just think it's, I think it's worth people looking at because I, I think that you guys have taken a risk as a family to make a product that I think a lot of people in the industry can use. It comes from a place 
of a lot of years of travel as overlanders. You guys have been a member of the community for a very long time. So for those that are listening, this is a small business. Dave and Tina own it themselves. They put all of themselves into this. So I just have a lot of respect for people taking that kind of risk. And it's a product that I use. So it, this ended up being a pitch, and yeah. I didn't. I didn't, mean, I didn't we mean appreciate it. the kind words. Thank well, I didn't. You, I didn't. I didn't mean it to be that way, but um, it is a product that that I appreciate myself. So I just want to congratulate you guys. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank taking, you. We're chugging you took, away. You took the short line. You guys decided you, you aren't on the short bus. You took the short line. Right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we took the it, short sometimes line. it feels like the short bus. <laughs> but you guys, you guys, you guys took you guys took the risk. And and you you put your heart and soul into creating something, and I just have a lot of respect for we, that. Uh, oh, we we are always reinventing, keeping it interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and and we're so grateful that you guys were on the podcast today. Oh, I'm thanks so, for I'm having so us. Grateful. We're so glad to finally be here. I listen I to every episode. So <laughs> yeah. It's nice to be in the chair for once. Yeah, and we we've had so many wonderful adventures together, including that first trip that we did together in Africa, um, which was just absolutely magical. And, and we'll do and it again. And the Grand Canyon one. Yeah, that was another really yeah. wonderful, that was spectacular. wonderful adventure. So thank you both thank for you, being Scott. on the podcast. Thank you, Scott. And we thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.